Hey, good morning, church family. It is a blessing to be with you again today. And as some of us are meeting at the church building, we are mindful that we are all the church. So whether you are at home or you are here, we are all the church. I do want to say one thing about that real quick, though, is that if you are able to be with God's people, you should be with God's people. I know there's some stuff that we need to be super careful about still, but I would hate for anybody to get in a regular rhythm of only watching church service online and not being in person with God's people because God's given us an amazing gift of community. And online church is absolutely no substitute for the fellowship that you get. Now understand this, if you need to be at home, if you need to be safe right now, if, you have, uh, if you're a little bit older or you have medical conditions that need to be at home, please don't feel bad about not being at church. But if you can be with God's people, man, come be with God's people. We miss you terribly. And we are reminded throughout Scripture that if every member is not together and, and using their gifts, that the church just can't be what the church was meant to be. So we need you here, and we hope that you need us as well. We look forward to seeing you. Hey, listen, today we're going to wrap up our series called Only Jesus as we've been diving into the book of Colossians. I hope that this has been a different kind of series for you in that you really don't need me or any other preacher to explain what Colossians is saying. We've just been able to open up the word and listen to what God is saying through his apostle Paul and just see how that changes our lives. So we're reminded of a few things today as we wrap up our series. And here's the first one, that Jesus is preeminent. He is supreme. He made you that in his life when he gave up all authority in heaven and he came to earth to die on the cross. He made you the most important person in his life. So now it's our turn to, to turn around and to make him the most important thing in all of our lives. We also understood this in Colossians as we work through it, is that you and I, as followers of Jesus, we need to be about, his, about knowledge and about spiritual wisdom. So we have got to be people who are always digging into the Word. If you're not in a rhythm right now where you are in the Bible daily, and hopefully multiple times daily, like where, uh, where honestly, we have free time. You don't pick up uh, social media anymore, but you're picking up God's Word. You're not turning on a TV anymore, but you're uh, opening up God's Word, and you are just feasting and feasting and feasting. But we also need to be people who are not all about knowledge. We're also about spiritual wisdom, which means we're putting that knowledge into practice, that the decisions that we make are no longer about what's happening right now, but they're all about how we can impact eternity. We also found out in Colossians that it is time for us to stop living as if we're actually spiritually dead. That Jesus, when he died on the cross, and that you and I, as we get to, to be in Jesus, in Paul's wording, that if we've died and we've been resurrected, he's talking baptism right there. If we've been baptized into Christ, that you and I are no longer dead, but we are alive. We're made alive in Jesus Christ. And so we have to stop living lives that look like we're just dead. It is time to move into the life that Jesus made for us. And of course, last week, we, uh, we wrapped up last week by, by talking about a word that not many of us really like all that much, and that's surrender. That the only way to really experiencing uh, life is actually surrendering your life to Jesus and to stop living it for yourself. And so uh, I hope this week has been full of surrender for you. And I hope it's been not all that painful, but I'll tell you what, as, as I start to surrender more and more things over, what I found out is this, the creator of the universe knows how to live this life better than I do. And if I just do it his way and let him flow through my life, man, life is so much better. And here's the big crux of it, guys, is that Jesus changes everything. So let's wrap up Colossians in chapter 3 today. I'm going to begin reading in verse 18. And just a fair warning, today is very highly practical. Uh, Colossians 3, beginning of verse 18, says this, Wives, submit to your husbands, as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily 
as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ, for the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. Man, one big question that we have to ask today is simply this. If you love Jesus, what kind of family member are you? Because it turns out that in Colossians, and Paul's writing, just, just like he did in Ephesians, he talks about how good God is, and then he gets really practical in talking about how God will now change your life if you submit to him. And that's been Colossians too. That's been Colossians because he started off by talking about the supremacy of Jesus, and now he's talking about submission to Jesus. And in our lives, very, very practically, in different contexts, because we're all in different stages of life, Paul wants you to see, God wants you to see through Scripture today that if you love Jesus, it will change the way you interact with the people that you love the most. Let's be honest with each other. Sometimes the people that you love the most are the people that you treat the worst. You know, I have to ask this this question to myself very often, more than I'd like to admit, is why in the world, Kenny, did you treat the stranger on the street with more courtesy than you treated the people that live in your house? Why were you so careful with the words that you said to to somebody you just met or the person at the grocery store? And listen, why did you preach about being nice to those people when you just went home and you weren't that nice to the people that you love the most? So here's some questions. If you love Jesus, what kind of wife are you? If you love Jesus... What kind of husband are you? If you love Jesus, our children and teenagers, what kind, of, what kind of child are you to your parents? And if you love Jesus, just overall, what kind of parent are you? you know, it turns out that, that God and, and his word, it approaches everything that goes on in our lives. And I just want to remind you quickly of the things there in Colossians 3. Like if you're a wife, what Paul says here is, wives, submit to your husbands. And that's not an easy thing by any means, but it turns out that when you submit to King Jesus, that's where it leads you. Husbands, love your wives and don't be harsh with them. Now listen, I I can't speak a whole lot to the the role of a wife because that is not my role. When it comes to this one, it hits home a little bit deeper as a husband because I know that there have been times where I've been unjustly harsh to the woman that I love the most that God has blessed me with. And I find myself uh, walking away times and just saying, what in the world did I just do? Why did I just react to that? Why did I just let the burdens of everything that happened during the day unleash on the person that I love the most? And I'm reminded and convicted here in Colossians that if I truly love Jesus and surrender to him, I won't be I won't be harsh with my wife. Uh, Children, this is a big one. If you love Jesus. It's very practical. You're going to obey your mom and dad. Teenagers, this is for you also. If you love Jesus, it will overflow overflow practically into your life. No longer is a love for Jesus just some abstract feeling that you have. It's not something that it's good to wear on a t-shirt. It's not something that you wear a necklace and people will know. No, 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 no. When you surrender to Jesus, it changes practically who you are. Things like sneakiness are gone. Things like disobedience are gone. Things like trying to craft your words so that your parents know part of the truth, but not all the truth. Those things are gone. No, 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 no. Here's what Paul says, is that if you love Jesus, children, obey your parents in the Lord. Why? Because it pleases the Lord. Paul wrote this in Ephesians chapter 6 also. You can look back there in verse 1. Fathers, listen to this, don't provoke your children lest they become discouraged. We need to be fathers, guys. We need to be fathers who are encouraging our children, who are telling them all the good things that they're doing and the good people that they can become. We do not need to provoke our children to anger. I thought as like before I had kids that this would be an easy thing. Like it would be a simple thing. Like this would be something that no one in their right mind would ever ever deal with. And then I had kids And now I realize that this is not as easy as it sounds. 
that I don't need to be provoking my children to anger. And, and it comes out for me in discipline a lot, is that, oh, it sounds so selfish for the preacher to be saying this, but it, it, it's like, okay, you did this, you disobeyed me, let me then let you feel some of the anger that I felt, and so I will intentionally sometimes try to provoke my children towards the, the same feelings that they made me feel. And then I read this and I think, what are you doing? Don't provoke your children. There's no such thing as good revenge when it comes to parenting. And as you go on, it talks about bond servants and obeying uh, everything. And, and of course, we don't have the bond servants right now, but you can really practically take this into your job situation. Uh, workers and bosses and all that kinds of things. Like obey in everything those who are your earthly bosses, um, not in the way of eye service and people pleasers. Like, it's not about making people happy. It's about surrendering to Jesus. And of course, we talk about like being parents it is just so important that you and I as parents, for those of us who are parents, that the, the gospel changes the way we are practically with our families. So again, that question one there is because of how good God is, because of Jesus being supreme in your lives, what kind of family member are you? I know not everybody has parents and are, who are around right now. Not everyone are parents. Not, not everybody here right now uh, is a husband or a wife. But you still got to be thinking about how you are personally. How you're relating to the people who are closest to you. Is the gospel really shaping and changing who you are with the people that you love the most? Going on in Colossians chapter 4, I'm going to read just the first six verses because it continues this same thought right before Paul gets to kind of the farewell to some people. In verse 1 it says this, Masters, treat your bondservants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of the time. And let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Now, church, based on what Colossians just said right there, I want to ask you a second question. Now, remember, the first one was simple. Based on loving Jesus and surrendering to him, what kind of family member are you? And here's the second question I want to leave you with today. Question number two is, if you love Jesus, what kind of influence are you outside of the church? What kind of influence are you when you are around people who are not holding you accountable? If you love Jesus, are you praying for open doors for the gospel? And as Paul said, are you praying watchfully, always looking for opportunities? Can you imagine what Paul's asking for the people to do there? Like, if there's anybody who didn't need an open door, it was Paul. He was just like... He was gung-ho with the gospel. He was taking it everywhere. But he still wanted the church at Colossae to be praying for him and saying, will you pray for open doors for the gospel? Look, some of us have, have sat around so long waiting for someone to teach the gospel, waiting for someone to find us and say, could you tell me about Jesus, when we really need to be spending time in prayer. And I would pair, pair it with fasting and asking God for this question, can you send open doors for the gospel? And when we pray that big, awesome prayer of open doors for the gospel, we are actually waiting and looking for people that we need to be telling the gospel to. So we're, uh, we're asking for open doors, but then we're not ignoring open doors. It turns out that when you're actually looking for it, you're going to see open doors all over the place. The people that you interact with at the grocery store, the waiters and waitresses at the restaurant, the telemarketers that are bugging you to death. Listen, if they will call you and tell you all about everything that you don't care about and that what really will not change your, your life at all, then they are a captive audience for you. Why not tell them about the thing that will really change their lives? Well, they might hang up. That's okay. Open door. They might, uh, they might get frustrated with me. That's okay. You're already frustrated with them. You don't want to buy what, they, what they're selling. Uh, let's turn around and give them something that is much, much better. Look, everything, every place is an open door. 
If you love Jesus, what Paul's saying here with your influence, are you wise with how you interact with outsiders? This is a tough one for me sometimes because I, I, I'm so, I try to be so wise when I'm with people from church. I'm, I try to be so wise with how I speak and the influence I am when I'm around uh, you know, Christian teenagers as well because I want them to be influenced in a great way. But sometimes when you're not with people who are holding you accountable, it's easy to try to let loose a little bit. And, and what that does is it allows you to stop interacting with outsiders in wisdom. And Paul wants to challenge you in this through Colossians, is that if you really love Jesus and you understand how good he is and you're surrendered to him, then you're going to be wise with people out in the community. That when you are talking with them and interacting with them, wisdom takes you beyond talking about the weather and takes you towards talking about souls. Wisdom takes you from talking about the coronavirus to talking about what really saves you want an easy way to do it. Um, I'm not always for this, and I'm actually against it sometimes. But here's one thing I had to determine in my life. If I'm going to wear a mask when I'm in public, if I'm going to be taking care of other people around me, that mask is going to be something that says something good. And so I wear a mask everywhere I go that says, Jesus saves, bro. And that's a little bit weird wording for it. But here's the cool thing is that I walk through uh, a Chipotle line because the guy's still got to eat. And somebody says, hey, I really like your mask. I'll say, oh, that's awesome. I can tell you more about Jesus. Or I'm, I'm going through the grocery store line, and I, and I see, and somebody sees that, they'll say, oh, that's a, that's a clever mask. And I'll say, yeah, it, it is kind of clever, and, I, and I'll wear it, but, but let me tell you what it really means. And listen, everything's an opportunity to use the gospel with wisdom. And the last thing that Paul wants to encourage us there is this. If you love Jesus, let your words show Christ. Man, I just want to try to explain this in one really clear way. Is that Paul doesn't qualify any of this stuff based on what mood you're in or what you've already gone through. And I know how hard it is, church, that, that uh, it's, it's easy for us to let our words show Christ when we're in the best of moods. But if we just sat in a long line at the bank because the inside's not open and you got to sit in the drive-thru uh, for an hour long just to get stuff done, it is easy for us to then take out our impatience on the person that really has no control over the situation. But that's allowing our mood and our attitude that is controlled by our environment to control how we're interacting with people. And what Paul's trying to get us to see is this. No matter what mood you're in, no matter what attitude you have, no matter what situation you're in, remember where Paul is when he's writing this. He's in chains. (laughs) Like he's in prison right now. And he has the audacity to say, treat people with kindness. You ever walk through a jail before? I have. The people that that you walk by, uh, I remember walking through a juvenile detention center uh, years ago, and I remember the people in there not being the nicest people. Like they were literally yelling things out at us that were vile. Uh, And there was just a lot of anger there. And and I'm saying that's what Paul is in. But he is in the midst of uh, of people that that are against his cause. Like that's why he's there. Uh, He would not be quiet about the gospel. So he is now in prison. Um, and, and, And this is not a good situation. But he still takes out his pen and writes this letter. Because no matter what situation you're in, no matter what attitude you think you should have, the only thing that transforms our minds is Jesus Christ, not our circumstances, not what happened to us, and not what somebody else did to us. Uh, In youth ministry, there was a song that we sang when we were on the bus, and and it was a silly song, but uh, but man, it, it rings true today, and it was loud, and it was obnoxious sometimes, and you've probably done this before. Uh, some people do it across stadiums if they're at Christian schools, but one side just says this, if you love Jesus, and of course it's, it's, uh, it's repeated, and then you, you say something, and then, and then you go this, this huge outpouring of, of, of loving Jesus. So I remember we, we used to do the inner city ministry in Orlando, and we'd drive the big yellow bus, and we'd pick up kids from, uh, from government housing and bring them to church. But on the way, one of my jobs was to lead some singing, and, uh, and, and boy, that was never good. I wish we had guys like Brian and Cliff and all those guys to do that, uh, because it was, it was 
okay, never mind. There's a reason I preach and I don't song lead. But, uh, but I remember singing that, like, if you love Jesus, clap your hands. And then everyone would start, na, 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 na. And it was, like, that wasn't a real way to show that you love Jesus, but the question was there. And the knowledge is there that if you love Jesus, it's going to change something about who you are. So in light of Colossians today, I want to leave you with one final question. How has Jesus changed your life? Let's meditate on that question as we sing a song together. And let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we love you so much. And we pray, God, that through your word you infiltrate our hearts, that you break, that you pierce, that you do whatever it is that, that, that is needed in our individual hearts so that your word can reign in authority. We submit today. And God, we are fully mindful and convicted and we repent when we need to repent that some of us have lived far too long claiming your name but never showing any change. And God, we want to declare today, King Jesus, you are supreme. You are the only one. You are on the highest place in all authority, and we worship you because you are king. But we also submit our daily lives to you. So God, as we raise our hands and surrender, I pray you take whatever broken lives that we lay at your feet and you change them into exactly what you want. Change us, Lord, from the inside out. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you, Orange Avenue.